Hello and welcome to today's edition of FNR Ask the Expert. Today we're going to be talking about tree inspections. Uh, we're joined by Purdue Extension Urban Forester Lindsay Purcell, Exotic Forest Pet at Pest Educator Elizabeth Barnes, and Entomology Extension Specialist Cliff Sadoff. And they're going to share about how to inspect your trees, what to look for, who to contact if you need help, as well as what invasive pests and diseases that you need to be keeping your eye out for, um, for your tree health and also for those of those others in the community. So it's only right that we're tackling this topic today as we're celebrating Forest Pest Awareness Week here in Indiana. And nationally, it's also August is Tree Check Month. So if you have any questions about inspecting your trees, uh, what to look for, who to contact, all those things, um, we invite you to put those in the comments section here on Facebook. Um, so Lindsay, let's get started with you. Um, where should I start um, when I'm talking about inspecting my trees, whether that's for general health or um, for pruning or whatever may be coming up um, this fall? Well, from my perspective, tree inspections are really come down to two important things. One is uh, to, to manage risk on the site um, so that trees or parts of trees don't fall on people or or cars or, or homes. And then the other is, which Elizabeth and um, Cliff are gonna talk about is plant health care. So those are the two primary reasons. Yeah, what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about just kind of what to look for in the tree as far as uh, managing, managing health. And also I'm gonna focus primarily on managing risk. And so the whole idea behind um, doing a tree inspection is just when you go out in the yard in the evening or in the morning, what we're trying to do is anticipate problems. And actually a tree failure can be prevented and predictable um, just based on what you see and with a little bit of proactive management and care. Oops. <laughs> Let me try that again. Okay, sorry about that. Again, so where the question is where to inspect? Well, anywhere within what we call the target zone. So if you were to measure the tree and say it's 60 feet tall, what we would want to do is lay that tree down, so to speak, visually, and then kind of draw a ring all the way around. So anything within that ring, as you see this um, animated picture of, of the of this tree. Anything that falls out of that tree or if the tree should fail in whole, that any parts of those are targets. So we can look under the drip line for branch failures or the entire tree high should the trunk fail and you have some trunk issues. So anything within that, within that area is called the target zone. So where do I look? Well, basically, I start with the bottom of the tree and just kind of work my way up. Um, so as I approach this, maple, this sugar maple, I'll look on the ground and I'll start to look to see if there are any fruiting bodies um, or fruiting structures, uh, such as we commonly see mushrooms, although they're not always, um, always um, present all the year. So we may not see that. I'll, oh, oh, this isn't going well, is it? All right, let's try that again. <laughs> so again, we'll start with the root zone and look for fruiting bodies, but also look to see if there's any type of uh, roots exposed or damaged um, and perhaps uh, girdling roots may be obvious and some of those areas are exposed roots that are damaged from lawnmowers, um, erosion, things like that. Um, we'll also look at the trunk um, you can see here we've had, lost a limb and uh, or perhaps it was a uh, prune and we look for decay or cavities in areas like that uh, to determine if it's actually healing or sealing well or if it's not. When you see this wound wood uh, developing around the pruning cut, that's a good sign that indicates the tree is recovering from that. As we move up the tree, uh, you can see some other pruning cuts. This is one where there was a stub left behind. 
Um, and obviously that support pruning cut and trees having a challenging time um, trying to seal that off. And so as a result, this acts as sort of a conduit for decay. And so as that tree or the part of that tree limb decomposes, it will move down through um, the translocating vessels of the, of the tree and actually in, invade the, the rest of the plant as well. Um, here's another pruning wound you can see they're starting to heal. I'll walk around and take a look see there's obviously some girdling roots there um, that could be causing some problems with the tree especially in the upper canopy and as I move up the tree I'll start looking at the branches and the crown to see if there's any damage or any broken limbs um, anything of that nature. I'll also look at crown structure uh, to see what kind of form it has, if there's any um, co-dominant stems. And as you can see in this particular area, this is what we call a co-dominant, where we have a one-to-one -one ratio basically of the, of the secondary stems to the primary stems. You can actually see a little crack here with some included bark. Um, that has an increased likelihood of failure because of that poor branch attachment. So that's something we certainly want to pay attention to and may need some mitigation um, with a professional arborist uh, to prevent that branch from failing. So I'll walk around to the other side of the tree. What I'm doing is just kind of a level two or a, a visual tree assessment looking for the obvious things like this. Um, this was most likely an old wound, probably from a large branch that had actually split off and you can obviously see it's not healing or sealing well. It's such a large wound. Um, you can actually see that it's hollow inside there. Maples are notorious for being poor compartmentalizers and often decay uh, quite easily. I don't know what's going on there, Wendy, but uh, I'll scoot ahead here. You can see the crack there I was talking about. Uh, let's go ahead here as I walk around the tree. See the decay from the hollow. Um, you might want to probe around in there to see if, how, how deep it actually is. And then I'll inspect some of the branches. This is an, what we call an overextended branch. So we wanna make sure we check the branch attachment at the, at the main stem to make sure it's strong enough to hold that. Here's another area where we have a, another weak branch attachment. You can actually see some cracking here. So this branch is obvious, obviously at a risk for failure. Um, and also another hollow area where an old branch had probably broken off from a storm and it's not healing well either. So this is kind of a increased likelihood for failure in those areas. So you may not notice those things on a normal basis, but this is certainly uh, some of the things you want to look, you want to look for in that process. Ugh. So really what you're doing is just reading the body language of the tree um, for plant health care and making sure that, uh, the tree safe and also healthy. Um, the, <laughs> finally, so what are you supposed to do now? Well, the most important thing is find a qualified arborist because the tree that such as this, the large tree needs special care, uh, perhaps a climber or an elevated lift. Um, so you would go to, if you want to find an arborist in your area, um, go to this website, treesaregood.org. And you'll notice that you see a link here, find an arborist. Um, and you'll just simply enter in your zip code and a list of, of arborists who have been through the ISA qualifications and certifications will appear. And that's a good start for the type of um, care that's probably needed in that situation. So a couple of publications, I think Wendy's gonna make those available um, by a link on the education store. Um, and those will be available for free download. So I think I'll get off here before I cause any more technical difficulties. <laughs> well, thanks, Lindsay. Um, it's great to be able to kind of walk through our trees a little bit and see what, um, what issues we should be looking for up front. For some more specifics on some of the pests or diseases that we should be worried about when we're looking at our trees, I'm gonna hand it off to Elizabeth and let her talk a little bit about some of our not so kind friends, the emerald ash borer, 
and the Asian longhorn beetle, among others. And uh, so Elizabeth, go ahead and take it away and give us kind of the rundown of what some of the things we should be looking for on our trees um, that, that could cause some of those health issues. Great, thank you, Wendy. Um, I wanted to start out by sharing um, this, this article that we wrote, um, Cliff and I wrote last year for Tree Check Month. And this will just walk you through some of the signs that you might have some sort of um, insect attacking your tree. Um, so the kind of two big categories are check the leaves and check the trunk and branches. And um, they go through a list of questions like, are the leaves yellow, red, or brown? And that of course is in the summer, if it's the fall, then your tree's probably fine. Um, are they spotted or discolored? And then for the branches, are there holes and splits, which is similar to what Lindsay just talked about? Um, is the bark peeling from a tree that shouldn't shed its bark? Um, and things like that. It's also really helpful to know what kind of tree you're looking at because what's healthy for one tree isn't necessarily healthy for another. Um, and you can find that out. We have a link in this article. And then I think um, Wendy's also going to share a link with you about where you can go to kind of do a basic tree identification. You don't need to know red maple from silver maple. You just need to know that you're looking at a maple versus looking at a birch versus an oak. Um, so now I'm going to stop sharing this screen and switch over and tell you about some of the specific invasive pests that we are particularly worried about here in Indiana. And I'm gonna cover a couple and then Cliff's also gonna cover a couple. So the first is the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, this is a pretty distinctive um, insect. It's been found um, popping up all over the United States over the years, um, which is the bad news. We've had repeated inter introductions. The good news though, is that when we catch it early, we have been really successful in eradicating it. So you'll notice on this map that I'm showing right now, um, these red spots are areas of active infestations. This was a map from, I believe, it's from January, so it might be a little outdated, but these are active infestations. So you can see Long Island, Worcester, Massachusetts, um, and in Ohio. Whereas there are some green dots, and those are showing places where the uh, ALB was successfully eradicated. Um, so that's the good news for this. Um, I do want to emphasize that because I think with invasive species, sometimes people can get discouraged and it can kind of feel hopeless and overwhelming, but with Asian longhorn beetle, we know what to do. We just need to know it's there so that we can actually take those actions. Um, so what does it look like? This is a basic Asian longhorn beetle life cycle. Um, the larval stages and the egg stage are pretty nondescript. So unless you're an entomologist and even then you have to really be focused on beetles to be able to tell the difference between these larvae and some other larvae. Um, I will say though, if you cut down a tree and you find a bunch of big sort of grubby looking things, uh, so these, these yellowish larvae inside your tree, um, and it's one of the host plants I'm gonna talk about in a minute, um, please do report that because it's better safe than sorry. When it pupates, it gets a little more distinctive and then the adult is very distinctive. There are a few other beetles that look kind of like Asian longhorn beetle um, that are native. But what we always say to people is if you suspect it's ALB, please do report it. Um, an easy way to kind of remember what it looks like is in uh, its native range, it's actually known as the starry night beetle because it looks like all those white spots look like um, stars on a black sky. So if you see something that looks like a starry night, snap a picture, send in a report. Even if you don't get a picture, please do tell us about it as well. Um, so this, this tree right here that I've got on the screen right now, you might think, okay, it's not the healthiest tree ever, but it, it's, it's doing okay. It's got a lot of leaves, it might be all right. But if you zoom in, you see all of these holes and there are also some little crater shaped marks on it as well. These are all places where uh, Asian longhorn beetle has um, exited out of the tree. So if you were to cut that tree in half, get a cross section of it, you would see the entire inside of the trunk was just all hollowed, hollowed out. So all it's gonna take is a strong wind at some point and this tree is coming down. Um, and this is why we do tell people if 
ALB, Asian longhorn beetle gets into a tree, it's a death sentence. Um, and that's why it's so important to report them. Um, and here you can see some of that hollow and you can also see one of the larval stages chewing away at the wood. So this is an earlier stage infestation. Eventually it will completely hollow out that tree and kill it. How do you identify it? Well, there are a few good ways. Um, first, you can look for these little, they look like little craters. It looks like someone's been throwing rocks at the tree. That's where the beetles chew and then lay their eggs in the center. Um, again, you can also look for the larval stages, but that's a little harder to recognize. Uh, you can look for the exit holes, which are actually, they really are just perfectly round. You can stick a number two pencil into them. It'll go deep into the woods. That's wood. Uh, that's a good way to tell if it's Asian longhorn beetle or maybe something else. And then you can look in the, the crooks of the branches. And if you find these little piles of sawdust, might not be Asian longhorn beetle, but honestly, there's something eating your tree. Either someone's coming in the middle of the night and secretly sawing away at your tree or there's something chewing away on the inside. So it's worth getting it checked out in any case. All right, so what does this thing actually eat? This is the really bad news. Basically everything. Maples, horse chestnuts, buckeyes, elms, willow, and then also they're slightly less preferred but other things they will eat in a pinch. Birch, sycamore, poplar, mimosa, catsura, ash, golden rain tree, mountain ash, hackberry, and several other trees that I wasn't able to um, fit on this list that are kind of a next stage tier of host plants. So um, these are all the types of trees you can find them on. Um, maples are really the ones that we say to focus on if you're checking your trees for Asian longhorn beetle because those are their absolute favorites, um, which uh, in, um, in the map I was showing earlier, one of the big worries when they first were introduced into the New England area was that they were going to get into the woods and get all the sugar maples. And if they get up into Vermont and then Canada, well, there goes our maple syrup industry. So moving on. Um, next, I'm going to discuss spotted lanternfly. So this is a fairly new invasive insect. Um, what I'm showing you here is a typical infestation of spotted lanternfly on a grapevine. They will absolutely cover the stems of those plants. Um, they originally came from Asia where they're pretty uncommon in their native range. Uh, that's kind of bad news for us because it means we're starting really from scratch. So a lot of the things in terms of management, so a lot of the things I'm going to tell you today about its biology, about the management techniques we're using right now, um, are the things that we're still really figuring out. Uh, this is a map that's showing you generally where it is right now. Um, I will say, actually, this map should be updated. It is now on Staten Island in New York that was recently found there, and it was also found in this area in Pennsylvania last fall. Um, so it's, it keeps spreading and spreading and spreading every year, um, and that's why we are telling you about it now, even though it's still on the East Coast. Um, this is the potential distribution map. So in the red areas, those are the areas where it was predicted to do really, really well. Um, and unfortunately for us here in Indiana, pretty much all of Indiana is that red color. So the parts that aren't are this yellow color. So that means that when it gets here, based on everything we know about it, it's going to just love it. It's going to thrive. So we want to know as soon as it gets here so we can try and contain it. Um, and yeah. All right, the life cycle is a little more easily recognizable here. Um, the first few instars are black with white spots on them. Um, some people get the really tiny ones confused with ticks. The trick there is if you kind of poke it and it just crawls along your arm, it's, it's something else. Whereas if it tries to hop away, it might be a spotted lanternfly. Um, then when it gets a little bit bigger, it starts developing this red color in its fourth instar, but it still has the white spots and some of the black. And then the adult stage, which is the stage that they are maybe in right now, is the flashiest stage. Um, here they have these bright red underwings, these spots, and they will kind of flare them sometimes on the trees too, so they're really eye-catching. Um, so if you see something and you think, huh, that's a weird looking butterfly, 
um, please do try and take a picture and send it to us because that's one of the most common descriptions we've heard of it is people just thinking it's a butterfly that doesn't quite look right. Um, and I do want to emphasize with the egg masses, there are egg masses in this picture. There are two egg masses right there. So they blend in really easily and that's part of why they've been able to spread so far. Um, all right, I'm going to skip some of the details about how they feed. Just suffice to say, basically suck all the juice out of the plant. So they stick their mouth part into the plant, um, feed on the phloem, and um, oh, I'm going to try a video too. I hope it works. Um, so in this video, you can see things kind of dropping down and it looks almost like rain. It's not rain, that's actually basically um, spotted lanternfly pea. It's something called honeydew. Um, it's the same thing as if you've ever had a really bad aphid infestation and everything under it kind of feels sticky. Um, same deal, it's honeydew, but imagine that with something many times the size of aphids. Oops. Okay, what does it feed on? Here again, we've got our grapes, birch, uh, maple, black walnut, roses, and at least 70 other species. Um, everything from um, really, really small plants to our rose bushes, all the way up to full-size trees. And that's one of the things we're very concerned about. Um, spotted lanternfly, in terms of the damage it actually does, in smaller plants like your grapes, it can kill them outright in a season. Um, and the ones it doesn't kill, it tends to make the crop um, just doesn't taste good, so you can't sell it. For larger trees, um, we're still figuring out the exact details of that, but it looks like they they actually weaken the trees over time. So repeated infestations um, mean that you're kind of slowly draining the life from these trees year after year. So then I, with that, I'm gonna stop there so that I don't go on for too long about spotted lanternfly. But if you have any questions about management, anything like that. I'm happy to talk about that later. So thanks, yeah. Elizabeth. Um, so we covered um, ALB, which is the Asian longhorn beetle. We've covered the spotter lanternfly. And Cliff is going to tell us about another one of our lovely acronyms, um, emerald ash borer and some other diseases that we need to be worried about. So Cliff, with that said, if you wanna take over and uh, just kind of fill us in on, on those things and what we need to be looking for in terms of um, ELB. Sure thing, uh, almost there. <laughs> I, I, I made a mistake here. I gotta get the big, uh, oh yeah, show my share screen, sorry. Can you see my screen now? Uh, you yes. should be able to. And, uh, you should see a slideshow now, right? With us in the middle, great, okay, perfect. Okay, I'll take this uh, this thing off, okay, perfect. So uh, one of the things uh, that, that, that I wanted to, to talk about is that, um, you know, we talk about a lot of exotic borers, but there are lots of borers we have to worry about here in Indiana that have been here for a while that aren't necessarily exotic. And I'm sure many of you have seen white pines uh, looking Somewhat like this uh, already, you know, there's a progression of trees from that are heavy, that are are uh, dead on the left to dying, and then to being normal on the right. Um, this is really common this time of year. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I took this picture a few days ago, uh, where we see a, a white pine just in the beginning beginnings of dying, uh, and when I got up close to it along the branches, I could see these shavings, these fine excelsior-like uh, wood shavings that come from a longhorn beetle uh, called the pine sawyer beetle. And then there are these smaller shavings over here, which are coming in from the, uh, from bark beetles. All right, and when you look to the bottom of the tree, uh, the, you know, it's almost being mulched in its own sawdust. Well, you know, mulching is usually a good idea, but when that mulch is made out of the, out of the tissue that's supposed to be conducting water from the roots to the leaves, that's not a good thing. And, and, and eventually that, 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 that tree is going to die. So we do have some native uh, beetles that are here and uh, they, they, they can be uh, quite, quite devastating. But emerald ash borer is, is, is a much different situation. Uh, it kills uh, all ash trees, uh, everything except maybe blue ash, uh, whether they're big or whether they're small, 
and uh, these trees I took a picture of in uh, Eagle Creek Park, and uh, some of these trees have a diameter, a trunk diameter of about 40 inches. So almost as tall as I am, I'm a short guy. But uh, so, so we've, uh, so, so these are, are, are quite devastating. Um, you know, they're fairly uh, common throughout Indiana, but what you wanna look for in the winter time is you look for uh, woodpecker activity. And what happens is that the woodpeckers will peck uh, and cause the, the peck, uh, the, the fleck off the bark and make it look somewhat blonde. This is what we call blonding. Uh, and this one, this picture was actually taken um, in West Point, uh, just south of town from here. And uh, the tree is actually another self-mulching tree. It's mulching itself in the flecked bark from the uh, woodpecker. This tree, if you would look up, is, is, is already dead. Uh, some of the early signs you want to look for would be vertical splits in the bark and uh, S-shaped galleries. Okay. So uh, that's what you have. Uh, and the S-shaped galleries you know, are caused by this, by, by this beetle. And then, as you can see on the right, the beetles are emerging, leaving their characteristic D-shaped exit holes. Uh, earlier on, though, you would just start noticing, like most boars, trees will be dying uh, from the top. And that, that's kind of what you have to see. So, uh, you know, when you're thinking about what Lindsay was talking about, targets, you know, uh, you would, if you could imagine this whole tree falling down, uh, you want to think about one and a half times, one and a half times the height. Now, um, one of the things we want to think about is that you can, in fact, save these trees when you have uh, uh, less than 30% 30, 30 thinning or less. We have a really good shot at saving these trees with insecticides. Once you have 50% thinning, you're going to man imagine the tree without the dead part. Okay, and that tree, there's just a couple of branches left over on this tree, and you can never really shape it back. But we do have some products available. Uh, there's a bulletin uh, that we updated uh, in uh, June of 2019 called Insecticide Options for Protecting Ash Trees from Emerald Ash Borer. It's available at emeraldashborer.info, uh, which is, uh, excuse me, it's, it's available at emeraldashborer.info nationally, and in uh, Indiana, it's at uh, eabindiana.info. Uh, so uh, there, there, there's, there are some sites that, that are available. Uh, one thing we want to remember is that these trees that are dying are a threat to public health. Uh, the branches are styrofoam brittle, and we have a, had a webinar at Emerald Ash Borer University uh, last April where we actually uh, discussed how to remove these trees without being killed. Uh, for most people, that means you call an arborist. For an arborist, you have to take certain safety precautions uh, so you don't get killed as, as the tree falls down. Uh, other problems we can run into, uh, uh, this is this uh, our thousand cankers disease. This is caused, these are dead walnut trees caused by a beetle that brings with it a fungus and the fungus makes these small dead spots uh, or cankers in the trunk. And as the cankers expand and they start to coalesce, they will kill an entire branch. Uh, and that's what, what, what kills the tree. Uh, it tends to be a problem in, uh, during excessive drought. Uh, it's more of a problem out west. But you know, one of the things we want you to do is that if you do indeed start noticing groups of black walnut trees dying, we would definitely want you to report it to uh, the 1-866-NO-EXOTIC uh, phone number uh, or the, uh, uh, we have a, an app called the Great, the Gledden's Early Detection app. Uh, where you can report report this, and a DNR inspector would come and take a look at it. Um, you know, these uh, beetles are actually uh, ambrosia beetles, and I mean these these are actually a, a kind of a beetle that actually will farm a fungus, and uh, that's uh, as you, these beetles are uh, bring with it a fungus that actually kills the tree. They're they're they're, they're quite um, quite small. Uh, they you have about uh, ten of these things feeding up fitting on the side. Of a face, uh, this uh, of a, of a Abraham Lincoln. These vials over here. Each vial has has twenty thousand beetles inside of it. So they're tiny little buggers, but they're strong. So if you see rapid decline uh, from June through uh, September, that's when we see we're likely going to have a problem. Um, one more thing I wanted to mention. Uh, I'm going to just uh, get rid of the screen here. 
Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again. And uh, I'm going to show you a new share. I'm going to share screen two. And I will share. And I'm going to bring uh, the screen over here. And uh, I, I did mention the, the Purdue uh, uh, Plant Doctor Suite. We have a uh, uh, we actually have a, a, a feature in the tree doctor and the shrub doctor that will allow you to report invasive species if you actually see them in there. So if you're seeing a spotted lanternfly, thousand cankers, or Asian longhorn beetle, we actually give you a way to, to report it. Uh, another one uh, in this, this app called the Purdue Shrub Doctor, these both are available free for the uh, iPhone and on the Android. Uh, there's something called the Boxwood Blight and the boxwood blight, uh, we have a lot of information about this uh, in uh, a blog that we put together called the Purdue Landscape Report. If you Google Purdue Landscape Report and find it, you can subscribe for free and find out what's going on. This uh, boxwood blight uh, is in uh, parts of, of, of Indiana, and uh, but uh, what happens is that you start noticing dieback in, in the shrub. So here's this planting over here. Uh, there's some dead areas, and uh, the entire um, you know you would look you would see these uh, lesions on the leaves, uh, dead twigs, and it's just rapid death uh, is, is what you're going to see. And it just, you know you'll see these these lesions on the leaves, these cankers on the stem, and uh, that you know, the tree just dies just 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 rather rapidly. And if you had a microscope, you could actually see some of the fungal spores on there. So um, I think, uh, you know, if you have a uh, boxwood uh, that are dying quickly, uh, just contact that one eight six six no exotic contact the DNR. Uh, they'll send somebody down and collect some specimens. And uh, if it is, these is suspect, and uh, we can definitely determine if boxwood blight is there. So that's about all I had to cover today. And I'll be happy to answer uh, questions. Cliff, if you want to stop sharing your screen, that'd be great. Oh. Um, yep. and then uh, we'll get to some of the questions we have. Um, Lindsay, we'll toss it back to you for a second. Um, how do I prevent some of those tree issues um, that Cliff and Elizabeth were talking about? Um, that you know, I can have weakened branches. I can have some of these things. Are there things I can do? Um, if I notice those, do I need to call a forest or an arborist um, to take care of some of those things? Just, I guess, what are my first steps if I do notice some of those things besides calling the invasive um, folks and letting them know? Well, if it's typically if it's a smaller tree, you know, a lot of those things can be taken care of by the tree owner. The larger tree means larger parts, more challenging access. Um, a greater deal, perhaps, uh, as far as uh, chemical applications um, would, and some of the chemicals that are necessary for mitigation of pests um, are um, professional use only. Um, but as far as the risk mitigation, oftentimes pruning can mitigate the risk. Um, but uh, the best thing to do is to get a certified arborist to come and take a look and see exactly what they want. Um, and make sure that they are certified in any tree, any tree service that does work. Make sure that you ask them for um, their certificate of insurance to prevent you from having any liability should they get injured or create or, or create some property damage at your at your location. Great tip there. Um, definitely want to make sure you're covered. Uh, make sure they're bonded and insured and all of those things. Um, to protect both yourself and your property. Yeah, so, just to, I guess I could add, add, on, add to that is that, you know, I, I always like to tell people to go to talk to an arborist because they understand, uh, they really understand trees. And, you know, you may see a couple of dead limbs and you, you can think you can cut the dead limbs off and that would mitigate the risk, but they could also notice some, you know, some rot on the main trunk with, you know, carpenter ants and, you know, and the tree might be hollow. And, you know, most people don't even know this. And I, I, I have a good friend of mine who has a silver maple, or should I say had a silver maple uh, until about uh, six weeks ago when we had some nice straight line winds coming through. 
and uh, they had somebody, and, and basically the, the wind force it was blowing the wrong direction because it blew away from their house. <laughs> And it took out the power in the entire neighborhood and it was out for like a six, six hours. And the tree was completely rotten to the core. So even though they, they you know, so if they were some dead limbs, they just had that taken care of. And if somebody, if somebody had looked at it, they might have been able to predict that. So uh, the arborist can really help you prevent catastrophic failures. And r relative to that, in the state of Indiana especially, um, tree owners have a, by law, have a duty to inspect and maintain their trees. And so if, let's say I go to Cliff's house uh, uh, to visit and a tree come, falls on my car from his lawn, then he is liable and responsible for the, those damages. So um, there's been a lot of speculation as to whether an act of God actually protects you and it doesn't. You still need to uh, keep your property safe, whether you need to be talking about your front steps or the trees in your lawn. So it's a good idea to get them inspected by a certified arborist. Good to know. We want to make sure we're in, a, in account with the law as well as uh, making sure our neighbors don't hate us. Um, so Elizabeth, um, you talked about some of the things that the major things we might see, you know, whether it's some of the pests or some of the diseases, but you talked about there might be sawdust on your tree that's not causing major issues and, or, you know, what if I find a mushroom or a lichen or any of these things that that don't look normal on my tree, should I be concerned? And is that when I need to call an arborist? What are what do I need to do um, in that case? Um, so, so to address the the sawdust, um, like I mentioned before, there if if you're seeing that something's eating the tree, um, so it is it is definitely worth getting checked out. Um, in terms of the the fungus and lichen and things like that. I think I will actually throw that over to Lindsay because I think he he might be able to give um, a more or Cliff or Cliff. I see Cliff yeah. making yeah. gestures. Um, either one. I I think you've got a little more experience with that than I do. Yeah. So uh, what I'd like to start off by saying is that uh, this is a plug for the Tree Doctor app. Okay. Uh, it's free. We, we, so uh, I'll share with you my profits. <laughs> okay, so th we're not making any money on it. Uh, but what, what the tree doctor has is that it, it's driven by pictures and by having and by problems and where the problem is. So if you have a tree and there's something wrong with your leaves, let's say it's an oak, you look at the oak tree, you look at pictures of oak leaves and you match the picture with, what, with the tree in front of you and you have a match, it describes what it is and what's wrong. If you've got a, uh, uh, say, um, a crab apple tree or, or a, a, and you start noticing some uh, uh, spotted lantern flies, if you notice these like silvery uh, insects and lots of honeydew coming out of there and you, you look up uh, your, 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 your crab apple and you see a picture of a on the trunk, you see a picture of a spotted lantern fly. Then you can make a match, and then uh, you know you can you can re report it. So so I think that in in, in terms of this uh, fungus is concerned, if you you know uh, uh, most of the trees that you can, that we have have fungal problems. So, I mean, excuse me, have a have lichen on the trunk, uh, especially if they're if, if they're shaded. So we have uh, pictures of different trunks uh, with lichen and you could pick the picture of the trunk and you can say, oh, that's lichen. I don't have to worry about that. That's just growing on the side of the tree. But if you start having fungi that are actually coming out from the trunk, uh, like say a chicken of the woods, or there's a couple of other different kinds of, uh, of uh, or, or artist shelf fungus, uh, our plant pathology buddies call them, call those fruiting bodies conchs. Okay, and they, they're called a conch, like a seashell, which is like, it's like kind of a seafood that has got this animal in there. It's called a conch, it lives in this conch, it's like a snail-like type organism. But we like to think of, well, Gail Rule, my a former pathologist here, used to, used to say, she liked to call them a conch, like C-O-N-K. So when you see fungi coming out of the main trunk of a tree, that means it's rotten to the core and it's going to fall down and conk you on the head when it falls there. So uh, you see fruiting buddies coming out of the main trunk of a tree, uh, you know, think it's about it's being rotten to the core and do what Lindsay said, call an arborist. 
they have tools where they actually, they'll take a hammer and they'll thump on it, you know, just like when, this time of year when you want to pick a ripe watermelon, it sounds like you're thumping a guy's chest. Well, they could tell if it's hollow by when, when they thump on it with, with, with a hammer. They can also drill through it and then figure out how much live wood is inside there and give you an idea of how long that tree is safe or if it needs to be removed immediately. You know, and when, was it four or five days ago, we had the derecho, the straight line winds come through here. Uh, you know, north of here, they had 100 mile an hour winds. So if you've got a tree which is half rotten, it will blow down. And so, uh, as Lindsay said, you have to be really, really, really careful about that. So fungi that are feeding on the heartwood or the uh, xylem, which is no longer conducting water, the structural wood, you know, that is what we were really worried about when it, when, when it comes to the fungus. Uh, some, uh, or if a fungus which is feeding on the roots and consuming, consuming the roots. And the I know, lichens, yeah. Sorry. Oh, Go sorry. I was, I was just going to add, um, I know we keep sort of emphasizing get an arborist to check out your trees. And I, you know, I've told that to people before and they've sort of grumbled because they don't want to spend the money, but it really is worth it. It's, it's, if there's something wrong with you, you go to a human doctor. If there's something wrong with your pets, you take them to the vet. You don't go to a vet as a human. It's plants are the same way. You need an expert to really understand what's going wrong with them. So that's that's why we keep saying this is go to an arborist. It's this huge, massive um, living organism in your yard and you wanna keep it going. And the best way to do that is to give it a checkup. So we mentioned that, um, getting a checkup for your tree. Um, Lindsay, where do I start if I find a problem besides the arborist? I mean, is there something I can do? Are there treatments I can do as a, a general citizen? Um, you know, will pruning help with some of these things? Um, I guess just where, where do we start if I notice my leaves are turning brown or parts of my tree are dying or different things like that? Where do I start? Well, I think a lot of things can be you know, the problem with self-diagnosing is kind of like self-diagnosing your health. We, health. We can find a lot of things on Google um, to kind of get an idea of perhaps what to talk about. But um, also, you got to make sure you have credible sources. So Purdue Education Store has a lot of resources on there. Oftentimes, if I think I've got a disease on a tree that I'm not aware of, I'll just Google diseases of trees, Purdue, and then Purdue's resources are usually pretty good. We have great pathologists and, and entomologists and outreach folks that have written a lot of great information that can help us. But also, you know, it's like Cliff mentioned, it's free app. Tree Doctor has been really helpful for those in the field things, and every homeowner has access to that through a smartphone. So those are some of the best things to do. And if you're out of the out of the area where you can't don't have some of those resources. Your county um, extension educator is a good resource as well. Um, those are all available in every county um, as a result of being a land grant college. Uh, Purdue Extension um, is available in every county pretty much. So that's a good way to uh, at least get started to know what your resources are that are available to you. Elizabeth and Cliff, um, I know you guys do a lot with the pest side of things and, and the, the, the plant doctor is obviously huge. Um, if people do have questions, um, are there resources that they can use, um, whether that's you guys directly, um, in order to get some of those things identified um, and make sure that, that things are on the up and up with their plants and trees? So, so there's, there's a whole bunch of resources. And I do want to kind of start out by saying, if you have something that you think is weird, you've lived here for 50 years, you've never seen this insect before, you're kind of worried about it, send in a report to any one of the places I'm about to mention, because we'd rather get, you know, a million reports of something that turns out to be a, just an unusual native species than miss an Asian longhorn beetle in a new area. So, um, 
there are a bunch of places to get IDs. So um, if you go to Report Invasive, which is um, Purdue's Invasive Species website, it's, um, it both tells you how to report invasive species, but it also has a collection of, it should be all of Purdue's Invasive Species resources. If you see anything missing from there, please let me know and I'll get it added. Um, so you can also sort there by um, sort of broad type of type of organism. So that might be like insects, animals, plants, as well as habitat type. So where, where do they live? Where did you see it? And you can sort the information that way. Um, and then you can also sort by resource type as well in a, a different section for looking at resources. Um, a couple of the big ones. Um, there's a website and it has an app connected to it called EdMaps. That's um, the, the app is the Gleden app, which Cliff has mentioned a few times. So that's a really great place for invasive species. Um, you can contact any of us at Purdue who work with invasive species and we'll forward it to the right place. Um, the DNR, Depart uh, Department of Natural Resources, um, their Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology, um, is also a great resource and they're the ones that that end up handling a lot of these invasive species if it's not an invasive species or you're not sure or you just saw something strange and you want to get to know what it is um, iNaturalist is really great so it's a um, it's the it's a website where and an, and an app as well where you can add pictures and then people will crowdsource identify it so basically in my free time, the bug nerd that I am, I will go on and help people identify the insects that they've posted on there. Um, if you're into birds, there's, um, oh, I just lost the name, Cornell runs something similar for, for birds as well. So there are a lot of those sorts of resources online for getting identifications, whether it's specifically invasive species or whether it's just kind of general species. and um, at least for our naturalist, you can take a picture of like a symptom. So say like an exit hole on a tree and a lot of times people will identify it that way. Um, the, and then finally, um, the Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab is a really great resource as well. Um, you can collect a sample and send it into them. And for a pretty small fee really for what they're doing, um, I believe it's fifteen dollars if you're within state, but don't quote me on Purdue that. Plant and diagnostic. Yes, yeah. yes. The okay, yeah. I, I just put a, I just typed a link to the Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab in the chat. Yep. And uh, it is eleven dollars. Oh, eleven. Uh, for this for the, for the specimen. So uh, that's that's it. It's been fixed that way for for a number of years. Yeah, and so and they'll. So what happens is that you mail it to them. They are the central agency at the university. Then they send it to me. They send it to Elizabeth. They send it to Lindsay. They send it to uh, the uh, plant pathologist, you know, Tom Creswell. So it gets shipped all over the place. So if you, wanna, if you want to tap Purdue's expertise, send it there, and they'll get it back to you. And I, I love getting samples because it's kind of like a crossword puzzle. I like to find out what's wrong. So we, we enjoy getting them, so. We all want to keep Cliff entertained. So yes. send it to um, So Lindsay, I'm going to toss this back to you. We talked a little bit about this earlier in the, in the spring, um, but as, as things toward, head towards fall and the weather starts changing and things like that, or as we get more storms, um, what should I look for in terms of, should I be concerned if I start having freeze damage or if my tree is struck by lightning? Um, those kinds of things, what should I look for in those cases and how do I differentiate that from maybe some of these other tree issues that we've talked about? Um, well, first, the freeze damage, um, we've seen that um, pretty significantly this year because of the uh, early freeze we had last fall and then the late freeze that we had uh, this late spring really was a hard one to punch on a lot of plants. Um, um, I really recommend people going to the Purdue Landscape Report, either on Facebook or our website. Um, we've had some great articles written about that and how to uh, manage those situations. But, you know, we're seeing a legacy effect on that freeze damage. Um, 
and coupled with we've got some we had we're at moderate drought um, right now so that doesn't help either um, but pretty landscape report will help with that um, as far as uh, freeze damage and, and then as far as lightning damage goes um, that's a really tough um, and challenging issue uh, lightning damage can come in a lot of different forms and oftentimes we don't know if it's going to recover from that um, but one of the things to do is definitely get that checked out by an arborist or somebody who understands tree risk because a uh, tree can look harshly damaged but recover quite well a lot of it depends on uh, the vitality and vigor of the tree um, pre-damage condition um, and also the species of the tree will make a difference but one of the worst things that can happen with freeze damage and or any type of environmental stressor is it, it predisposes the plant to insects and diseases so um, which which begins that um, a decline spiral or mortality spiral and um, usually it's a secondary uh, causal agent which actually cause the biggest issues because environmental stressors can often be managed um, by the tree owner themselves and then once those secondary agents uh, become involved and that's when uh, you need the professionals like Cliff and Elizabeth to help answer some of those questions. Cliff, Elizabeth, anything to add to that from your standpoint? Okay. Um, so as we wrap up here, a few things. Um, Purdue Plant Doctor, you can diagnose your own things. Um, if that's too much for you, call an arborist. In fact, we say call an arborist, call an arborist, call an arborist, because they can help you find the things that you may not know, and you may be able to manage some of it with pruning, those type of things, but um, it's always best to ask an expert. Um, so we recommend that. Uh, the Purdue Landscape Report, as all three of them have mentioned, is key. You can actually subscribe to that. Am I right, Lindsay? Yeah, you can subscribe to that via email. And we also post um, those on our Purdue Extension um, FNR website as well that you can access those um, amongst our blogs. And Lindsay writes quite a bit uh, for us in terms of tree damage and those type of things as they come available. Um, it's National Tree Check Month. You still got a few few days left. Um, that doesn't mean you can't check your tree if it's not August, um, but we definitely recommend that. Um, and uh, you know, find find help if you need it. Whether that's sending pictures to Cliff, Elizabeth, or Lindsay, or um, using the tree doctor or plant doctor, um, or the DNR services, all of those things. So we we definitely want to make sure that you are checking your trees. Um, and I guess to wrap up. Uh, for each of you, you've talked about specific tree damage issues. Are there specific times of year or is the reason August is tree month um, because this is the best time to check? When is the best time to check for these various things? Um, Lindsay, I'll start with you. Basic tree damage, basic pruning, those type of things. Is this the best time to do that? And then Elizabeth and Cliff, if you can talk a little bit about the pests and disease timing. Non-pest related, um, relative to abiotic issues, um, I always think it's a good idea to go check your trees after um, a significant environmental event, storm, whether it be wind or lightning or snow or ice. It's a good idea to check those. Um, and also on a you know droughty uh, period, um, check to see leaves curling or early fall color. Then there, there's some issues, um, which typically leads to the pest issues. And I'll give that to Cliff uh, to start out next. Yep. So uh, I think that for for insects, like uh, since borers are probably number one on the list uh, of, 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 the, of the real risky problems, uh, they really show their they're easy to see in August because you're cutting off the circulation of of the tree. So if you're gonna you're cutting that off, you're gonna see it. It's gonna be more dramatic during the drought. So in August and September, that's the, that, that's when it's really gonna happen. Uh, of course, there's always exceptions. You know, Asian longhorn beetle feeds inside and, and you know, it doesn't cut off the vascular tissue that much, but the spotted lanternfly is is, is, is out there as well. So uh, fall is, uh, I mean, so late summer and fall is uh, probably a really good time for it. Although if uh, you're looking for uh, wet areas and stuff. Sometimes it's easier to look at those trees in the springtime when there's no leaves on them and you start getting some excessive we weeping, slime flux, and those sorts of things. Crawlers. So you, what? 
the crawlers. Crawler. Oh yeah, crawlers coming in from for, for, for scale. So, you know, it's almost like a, you know, it's kind of like your heating system, you know, heating cooling system. You want to check it once a season. <laughs> And Elizabeth, to, to wrap us up so we don't scare people incredibly, um, we've talked about some pretty scary diseases and pests and destruction of trees and all of those horrible things. Um, I guess one question we've had is, is, what is the danger of these pests that are out east or that are nearby in Ohio, Illinois, of actually making their way here um, to Indiana and uh, killing our trees here locally? So, so that's gonna kind of, it's gonna depend on the insect. Um, Asian longhorn beetle, I will say it does, it does keep appearing. And so um, we need to keep our eyes peeled, but at least we, we have a good way to handle it if it shows up and we know it's here. Um, spotted lanternfly, which is the other big thing we want people watching for. Um, it, uh, it, it, it seems to keep spreading and spreading. Um, I'm not hopeful right now that they'll be able to contain it. Um, I, I think it's only a matter of time. Um, they're, they're trying their best to kind of slow the spread, but I think at this point it seems like the point of slowing down the spread is more about giving us more time to learn about it and learn how to control it so that it, when it does get to other areas, we're better able to kind of manage it and live with it and not have it ruin everything. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it's going to depend on the insect. Yeah, I just want to, I just like to add about that, that the um, uh, many of these invasive species are one pickup load of firewood away from us. Okay, so, you know, uh, check your tree. And if your tree dies suddenly, it died from something that killed it. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to take that, those dead pieces of wood, which are full of whatever kind of inoculum that killed that tree, and take it to your favorite place in the forest and have a little campfire and give them a free ride to kill your favorite trees. That's, so, a, good, that's a good point. There's a difference between chronic death and acute death. And... You know, a slow, slow dying tree usually means it's an abiotic issue or typically something else, but an acute death means something, something is uh, really amiss. Oh, Elizabeth has got some prizes for people, right? Right, right. Thank you for reminding me. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, I know it's, it's kind of late in tree check month, but um, we'll, we'll give you a little wiggle room if you check your trees a little later um, and do this, that's fine too. Um, if you go out and check your trees for some of the things we talked about, take a picture of yourself doing it, um, and then follow and tag us on any of our social media platforms. So that's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Report Invasive. Um, we, will, we will mail you some invasive species stickers. And I've got the insects ones here with me, but we also have some pretty snazzy feral hog and Asian carp and things like that. Um, so check your trees, let us know you did it. If you don't do social media at all and you're watching this, just email me a picture. I'll send you some stickers too. But um, yeah, so, so get out, check your trees and you get some prizes if you do it. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. And if that's not all you need to know to check out your trees, I mean, pretty snazzy stickers sounds like a great way to go. Um, but th I wanna say thank you to Lindsay, Elizabeth and Cliff. I know this was a little non-traditional today. Um, but I think the information was still great and hopefully we can get some of these people out there to check their trees and call their local arborists and foresters and um, prevent some of the spread of these diseases and keep uh, trees from falling on folks as well. So um, thank you all for joining us. Um, we have next week off uh, as it's the first week of school and we want to make sure all of our experts have uh, the attention on their students and uh, the things that we um, have coming up that way. I know we all have a lot to focus on. Um, we have a chock full month in September, so stay tuned on Facebook and um, our events page, and we'll update you as those events are announced. So thank you for joining us, and thank you again to Cliff, Elizabeth, and Lindsay, and uh, we will see you next time.